Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. <laughs> Ain't a fucking. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I don't I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. Well, we get straight now? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Next. A little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, Phil here from the Groovecast, and this is the intro before the intro, or as they say on Jersey Shore, this is like the shirt before the shirt. Anyway, this is a special instructional slash educational edition of the podcast, and uh, we're going to do a series of these, but they're all not going to be weekly, they're going to skip a few weeks here and there, Uh, and we had planned on doing this, it's just we didn't really expect to do it this early. However, I'm going to lay the blame for that squarely at the feet of you, the listener. And it's because in response to our first couple episodes, the first few emails and the first few like post responses on our uh, Facebook page were in regard to, hey, why don't you guys do something regarding click tracks, playing with clicks, playing with sequences. And I thought, well, you know what? Strike while the iron is hot. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I've been developing some conceptual stuff regarding playing with click tracks. And so why not go ahead and share with you guys what I've been thinking? So anyway, we're going to go ahead and jump on into that uh, topic in just a second. But uh, next week, we'll be back to our regular show. It'll be Phil and John just sitting here hanging out, talking about this, that, and the other. And uh, we'll also go ahead and try to answer some more of your questions at the end of the show. Thanks again for listening to us. We really do appreciate it. And now on with this week's special edition. Get out of my way, son. You're using my oxygen. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Congratulations. You found the beat. Well, hey there, everybody. Hey, it's Phil here from uh, Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Um, I'm doing a solo show today. It's a very special Drummer's Weekly Groovecast, and this is the first of one of what will be many of our instructional segments. Um, And I've gotten already quite a few comments on Facebook, emails, etc., asking about doing something regarding playing with click tracks. And uh, as you're probably well aware of as working drummers and even student drummers, boy, virtually everything we do these days, um, even live, it's done with a click track. And uh, as us veterans know, it was certainly not that way quite a few years ago. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in a galaxy not that far away and not that long ago, Um, when I was in graduate school less than 25 years ago, I never played live, uh, to any type of, uh, of a metronome or sequence. And for that much, even when we did stuff in the studio, it was 50, 50 on whether or not we did things, uh, with a click track. But, uh, today that is certainly not the case. Uh, Virtually every gig that I do there is um, the presence of a metronome and or sequences or loops. Uh, That's not to say that we use it on every single thing that we do, but um, it's there, it's present. And so uh, there's a couple things I I guess you could probably say that that lends itself to that. And that is that um, 25 years ago, and even recently, more recently than that, The reason we didn't do it is because um, it wasn't cost effective, but nowadays we have so many cheap ways uh, to deal with technology and electronics that it's very easy to hook these things up 
And then while we're talking, the other reason is while we're talking about technology, quite honestly, some of that technology 25 years ago or 30 years ago just didn't exist. I mean, nowadays, virtually every loud volume gig that I do, I'm wearing in-ear monitors, which uh, it makes it pretty easy then to clandestinely play with uh, a click and or loops or sequences. I mean, back in the day, if you were using, you know, floor wedges, the audience could hear the click, click, click coming through the wedges. It's not a good thing, right? So, you know, that's a few of the reasons why uh, why they're so predominant and why we use them so much today. Much less if we start talking about certain types of pop, popular music. Um, I mean, they are already programmed in the studio, so it's very easy just to take the sequences or loops that were used in the studio and play with them live. So there's even another reason for you. But what I'm going to talk about today is just general concepts as far as like what I do and what I like to do regarding how I approach playing with clicks and or sequences. Um, I also like like to talk about how I actually set these things up as well. In other words, how I set up a metronome or how I set up sequences or computers, um, you know, to be able to use them in a live situation um, or in a studio situation. And then we're going to talk just about how you actually do it. In other words, how we actually play with that. So anyway, just to go ahead and get started, here's just a few of just my general concepts and general things that we're going to globally cover in this podcast. And the first overall thing I want to really uh, impress upon you is that we as drummers, we are accompanists. So we back up people. We accompany other people in the rhythm section. That's our primary focus. That's our primary job is we are accompanists. And as accompanists, we have to play solid, steady, consistent, good feeling time, regardless of the style, regardless of the tempo. And so if you embrace that and you realize that that is your main goal as a drummer is to be the accompanist, which means to provide that good feeling groove, that good feeling beat, that good feeling time, you are on the right path. And a metronome or a click or a sequence, that is not anything to be afraid of. As a matter of fact, Ndugu Chancellor says when he plays with a click, it's total freedom. And so, you know, more on that in a little while. But when we talk about playing with a metronome, there's a very common misconception that I want to go ahead, throw out on the table. It's, a, it's a, a, again, a misconception. And I'll guarantee you every single person that's listening to this right now has either had a teacher say this or you have said it. And that common misconception is playing with a metronome will help your time. That's not correct, guys. Playing with a metronome does not just intrinsically help your time. What? What what did he just say? Yes, I just said it. Let me say it one more time. Just playing with a metronome does not intrinsically help your time. Think about that for a minute. I'll sit here and wait. Okay. Here's what I really mean by that. Okay. When you practice with a metronome, you need to be thoughtfully and mindfully practicing with a metronome. Because what a metronome really does is it makes you aware of your tempo and feel tendencies, whether they are good or bad. So just for example, if you have a metronome set at 52 and you are playing a ballad and you are rushing like crazy, you can feel yourself all over the top of that click, then you have a tendency of rushing. Just playing to that click at that tempo does not fix that. You have to be 
aware of it. When you are aware, aware of that tendency, you can then fix it. Same thing, let's say you're playing an up-tempo song, and it's at 220. If you are barely hanging on by the skin of your teeth, by the skin of your sticks, then you know you have a tendency to drag at 220 at that style, and therefore you correct it. Again, it's all about being mindful. It's all about being aware. So that type of deliberate practice when you're working on these tempos with a metronome That's what's going to help you fix your time and help you fix your feel. So therefore, if you happen to be playing a gig or playing somewhere where you are not using a metronome, if you are playing that ballad at 55 BPM that someone calls out, you will know, hey, I've got to lay back a tad bit or I'm going to steamroll this thing and, and rush the tempo like crazy. So I just want you to keep that in mind when we talk about this and when you're in your practice. So, and, and just to kind of button that up, everyone has different tendencies at different tempos and using different styles. And for that much, even different volume levels. Like, for example, if you are a super heavy, hard hitter, the in general, most people who hit very, very hard or you're playing at loud volumes, there's a tendency for the tempo to fall back anyway a little bit, to drag a tad bit on that. So that's what I mean by these different tendencies or different tempos, different styles, different volume levels that you play at. They all give you different tendencies for rushing, for dragging. Same thing if you were playing with brushes. They give a totally different feel and response. So... Again, therefore, when you're practicing, be aware, be mindful, and that is what improves your time when you're playing with a click and then ultimately when you're playing without it so that you don't become click track reliant, which is, man, that's a whole separate podcast, okay? But I digress. Uh, Moving forward now, now that we kind of have just just a general concept of of what we're talking about when we're talking about playing with a metronome. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about setting up your click, uh, what to listen for, so to speak, that type thing. And the first thing that I want to say is get comfortable and embrace using a quarter note programmed click track. Okay? Now, Let me go ahead and say right now that there are a lot of sequences, a lot of tracks, a lot of different prepackaged things that are out there that you can find on almost uh, on a whole, well, a whole lot of different websites. They come with click tracks that have eighth notes and sometimes 16th notes programmed for you to play with. I am not a fan of these overly subdivided click tracks. And I'm going to give you a whole pile of reasons here. Um, First, and I think this is probably the most important thing, if you use an overly subdivided click track, to me, it makes you play target practice with the click. It really kind of puts you into a corner. It kind of boxes you in. It kind of pushes you into a corner to where, uh, for example, if you're using an eighth note click at a fairly fast tempo, let's say at 110 or 116 or something like that, it, it almost forces your right hand, if you're playing eighth notes or 16th notes, to like play right on top of that. And that's not a good thing, guys. Uh, having overly subdivided click tracks is not a good thing. You need to be phrasing in between those clicks using your own phrasing, whether it's eighth notes or sixteenth notes. In other words, you need to be the subdividing factor there. Every single one of us as humans has a different feel. We have a different lilt to the time that we play. And whether that's straight eighth notes, straight sixteenth notes, whether it's triplets in a shuffle or a triplet-based jazz swing ride pattern, 
all of our phrasings and our beats have a different phrasing and a feel to it. And in my opinion, using the overly subdivided click track, it severely hampers that. It, again, like I said, the best way I can say it is it makes me feel like that you have to play target practice and land right on top of those clicks. And that is not the case. And I'm going to even expound, I'm going to expound a little bit about that even on quarter notes here in a few minutes. So that's the first big thing is I think it hems in your phrasing and forces you to play, again, target practice. The other thing is that if you use a quarter note click, it allows you to phrase other rhythms without having to basically play polyrhythmic phrases over top of, of more subdivided clicks. And, and the easiest example for me to, to tell you about would be just simple eighth note triplets. If you are playing, let's say, just a straight eighth note, medium, medium tempo song at, say, 96. If you play a quarter note trip, or excuse me, eighth note triplets over an eighth note click, you're going to be playing a sort of pseudo three over two polyrhythm where those notes are not exactly going to line up. You don't have that issue if you're playing with a quarter note click. In other words, the quarter note click is somewhat universal. There are very few things that are going to conflict with that. So that's just another, another reason why I like quarter note clicks. But, but again, I'm going to overstate this. Playing with overly subdivided clicks has a tendency to tear up your feel. Tore up from the floor up, right? So do the phrasing yourself. Don't be dependent on a machine. To phrase it because remember we're trying to play good feeling time here not just metronomic time we want consistent good feeling time now let me say this now that I've talked about quarter notes and I feel like you should use quarter notes far and away the bulk of the time I'll tell you a few times when I don't use quarter notes if I have a super super slow song and that would be a song that's at 50 bpm maybe 60 bpm or lower i think it's okay to use eighth notes then um sometimes it's just practically practically the beats are too far apart at say 50 bpm and you're using quarter notes um if i have the option though i will tell you this those eighth notes that I might program at 50 BPM, I will actually, if I have the capability of doing this, keep the eighth note volume a tad bit lower than the quarter notes that are going by on counts one, two, three, and four. Now, with that being said, let's talk about some super fast tempos. There are a few songs that I play in some of my regular groups that are up in the... Um, straight eighth note, 220, 240 um, kind of tempos. And I'll actually use a half note click a lot of times with those because at the faster tempos, quarter note clicks can box you in much like uh, an eighth note click will box you in at, say, 100. So I think the half note clicks at those upper tempos are a wonderful thing. For the same reason, again, that the quarter note clicks are wonderful for the slower tempos. And then one last thing is when I do my jazz gigs, those are the pretty much the sole occasions where I do not use a click live. Worst case scenario on something like that is if I've got a, if I've got a metronome on my phone. Well, actually, I do have a metronome on my phone. If we need a tempo... If we want to get somewhere to the ballpark, I'll just dial up a tempo there and memorize it and get on with it, right? But in practice, I do use a metronome when I'm playing swing. But what I do is I put my metronome on whatever half note tempo that I'm using. So let's say I'm playing something up tempo and it's at 300. I'll put a metronome on 150 and then place the metronome on what would be counts two and four. 
which would be if we're playing super straight ahead, high hat is normally on two and four. So we're saying that the click hits with the hi hat on two and four. So that's just another way that I practice. And I think it's actually a, a good feeling uh, type of practice also to play when you're playing uh, jazz repertoire. So there's just a couple of things I wanted to relate to you to let you know that I'm not 100% dogmatic on the uh, quarter note uh, click settings because, like I said, there are plenty of valid Plenty of valid reasons to use a, a subdivided click at a super slow tempo and good reasons also to use a half note click at a very fast tempo. So moving on, more about setting up your click. I'm not, I'm not a tone Nazi on a metronome. There are some guys that I know that have to have a certain tone. And I mean, it is, it is absolute heresy. It is offensive to not have the tone that they are uh, comfortable with. The only thing that I really dislike, or so there's two things I dislike on tones. I'm not a huge fan of the old Yuri click. It sounds like a little static pop for those of you who are not familiar with it. I, I, a lot of the older studio guys like it because that was such a common piece of gear back in the day for a click generating sound that, that that's just what they came up with and they're real comfortable with it. Um, I don't particularly like it. I feel like, I don't know, for some reason I feel like I have to make that, that sound louder uh, than, I have to, than I would like. And, and honestly, I, the thing is, is I don't, generally set my click that loud to begin with. It's just there's something about that frequency that just doesn't sound uh, appealing to me. And then part two of that, uh, really quickly about something that I don't like. I am not a huge fan of having a downbeat, like a downbeat separate kind of a chime or tone on count one. I'm just not. Now, I understand that there is a valid use for that, especially if you're doing a lot of like time signature changes and whatnot. I get that. And I'm okay with it that, but just general 4-4 uh, four, four style playing where uh, time signatures don't change, not, not a fan of that downbeat. Don't necessarily need it in my opinion. So again, find a tone that works for you. Most com of the little computer generated uh, tones that come from all the common DAWs work fine for me. All of them are good. Um, on like your general, like your popular metronomes that people like to carry around, like Dr. Beats and uh, rhythm watches and groove stations and that kind of stuff. If there's a couple of tones available, I normally choose the less piercing one or the lower pitched one. And again, it's just, just my preference, but it's, it's not, like I said, it's not a deal breaker to me one way or the other, but you might find... Uh, you have a, a very strong preference one way or the other. So that's all I want to... Oh, you know, there is one last thing I want to say about it. Is be careful sometimes. Uh, there are certain generated tones that have different lengths. And what I mean by that is some of the clicks are a little wider in tone or wider in length or resonance. And then some are really short and super chopped off. So that kind of stuff can actually affect the way you hear time. Just as a matter of fact, just this last week, I was doing uh, a gig where there was a, a, a sequence that played and the click track was a, had a very long, uh, almost reverb uh, affected style click that was on there. And it was it was it took a second to get used to that to figure out how I was going to phrase my time around that. So that's just one last thing to be aware of when you're talking about click tones and click lengths. And then the last thing I want to talk about uh, with your click track settings and just your click track setup is you need to place uh, your metronome or your computer if you are the folk that is in charge of running this monstrosity somewhere that is close to you to be able to, of course, turn it on and off, to be able to go from one sequence to the next or one tempo to the next. 
it's very important that you have it in a place that is easy to access. Now, again, if you're not the person that's in charge of that, you can just skip ahead for a few minutes or whatever. But I, I feel like that uh, the majority of the bands uh, that are out there that are using sequences or clicks, it it really feels like the drummer is in charge of that. Um, there's been a few situations that I've played at where the keyboardist was in charge of it, but it seems like it's uh, more than not the drummer. So here's what I like to do. I like to put my metronome and or computer or laptop on my left side, on my hi-hat side. I'm a right-handed drummer. So I have a couple of different ways that I place these these instruments. If it's a laptop, I generally have some kind of a either a, a music stand to where the tray is um, horizontal to the floor, just sitting flat, and uh, I'll place my laptop on that, make all the connections that need be there from there, and then with my left hand, I can, you know, start and stop on the space bar or the number keys or, or however your um, sequencer works. And uh, also, it's normally pretty easy to hit the, you know, the arrow buttons or the arrow keys or, again, however you go from sequence to sequence. Um, so that's how I'll do it. And if I have just a metronome, what I'll do is I'll have some kind of a um, piece of hardware, like a mounting hardware. And I think virtually every company that makes a mountable metronome uh, has a corresponding piece of hardware uh, that you can buy that easily fits on cymbal stands, uh, will fit on your hi-hat stand, on the large uh, tubing of your hi-hat stand. And that's what I do. I actually attach mine to the bottom part, the large part of the tubing of the hi-hat stand. And uh, that way, with my left hand, I can very easily start and stop the metronome. I can very, very quickly um, change tempos. Or if I have the set list programmed in, I can very quickly scroll through the set list and get to the correct tempo that I need. And, and by the way, while we're talking about that, let me go ahead and say this. Uh, as far as metronomes themselves go... I highly, highly suggest that if you're going to be making uh, these tempo changes on the fly, like if you've got a schizophrenic band leader, even if it's yourself that's calling tunes and you're not sticking to a set list, if you've got um, kind of a dial or a wheel that's on the metronome that will allow you to scroll very quickly to go from tempo to tempo, in other words, you could be playing a ballad at 63 BPM and then all of a sudden you could scroll all the way up to like 160 within like a second. That's what I like. I think it's a lot easier to deal with than, than one of the old, say like Dr. Beats, where you would have to use like a button and hold a button down. So I like those that have that little wheel or dial. So just a suggestion for you on that. So that's pretty much it when it comes to setup. Uh, that's what I use, I should say. I know some guys like to use foot pedals that they can um, actually sit beside uh, one of their pedals, whether it be a hi-hat pedal or a bass drum pedal. I don't like that. I normally do use just my hands uh, to do that. But that's just my suggestions for you as far as that goes. That's what I like to use. So now that we've kind of talked about how what our general thought uh, process and what our concept is about playing with clicks and playing with sequences and then actually then setting up said click or sequence. I want to talk to you about now actually playing with the thing. In other words, going into practice. And what I mean by going into practice is not just practice room, but also in the studio or on gigs. So talk a little bit about that. Naturally, You've got to have it loud enough in your ears, and we're assuming that it's either in your monitors or headphones, that you can hear it when you're playing your loudest volume, and also you can hear it above the other musicians in the studio or in the band when you're playing live. So that's, I mean, it's, that's pretty obvious, but I've learned before in the past... <laughs> Don't be afraid to over or don't be afraid to overstress the obvious. Okay. Uh, now, 
Next thing. In any style of music, it, one of the most important things you can be as a drummer is a great listener. And the majority of the time when you hear teachers or you hear other musicians talk about it, they are, they are referring to listening to the other members in the band, which is vital. It's absolutely critical. I would say most people, most musicians, are guilty of not listening to the rest of the people in the band. So that is a very valid concern. Now, I'm going to fly in the face of convention here and tell you that one of the most important things to do when you're playing with a sequence or a click is also listening to yourself. And I want to stress that and I want to explain that. You really have to listen to yourself. I had a, a hard time. I've been practicing with a click for decades, but really didn't become super serious about it until probably 15 or 20 years ago when I could kind of see the handwriting on the wall that this was going to be something that I was going to be dealing with on a daily basis. One of the issues that I had when I first started doing this seriously was if I recorded myself, sometimes I would go back and listen to it and things just didn't sound exactly right. And, and this is a very common phenomenon. And I have students and friends that come to me and say that all the time. They're like, I had, this, I had this one friend of mine that had done a session and he gave me the MP3s and he was like, man, listen to this. And I said, okay, great. I said, I'm really looking forward to it. And he goes, well, aside from listening to it just to hear what we're doing, he goes, I want you to listen to what I'm doing. And I said, sure, of course, you know, I'm once, once you're a drummer, you're always a critic of everyone else, so of course I'll be listening to you. And he said, well, we recorded this whole thing to a click, but it doesn't sound like I'm playing to a click. And I said, well, congratulations, that's actually a great thing, right? And he goes, well, n no, I don't mean from it necessarily being a great feeling, great sounding thing. I feel like that there are some, some just issues with the time, even though we recorded with a click. And so I pretty much nodded my head and I said, yeah, I... I I know exactly what you're talking about. And leading back to the initial point on listening to yourself, where this issue comes from, these little time anomalies, is there are many, many times that we're listening either too closely to the click itself or we're listening too closely to the other musicians in the band, and we are not leading, we are either being led, or we are, again, playing target practice with a click. Okay? Again, I want you to think about that. I'm going to state that again. We're either being led by a click, or we are being distracted by the other players that are playing, or we're playing target practice with a click. Okay, we're not listening enough to ourselves because regardless of a click, you have to be in time with yourself. Okay, your beat, your groove, regardless of the style, regardless of the tempo, has to be in time with itself. That is crucial. That is critical. It's going to sound bad and feel even worse if you are not in time with yourself. And you have to listen to yourself as you play. The, the term that I like to use whenever I'm playing with a click and or a sequence, I like to use the term averted listening. And what I mean by that is the click is there, the other musicians and or the sequence is there. But first and foremost, I am making sure that my house is in order, that my time in my feel is in order, that I am playing thoughtfully, musically, and I'm playing consistently, and it feels good. <clears throat> that, I, could, I should just hit stop right now, because that, that, that's the crux of what we're dealing with here, Okay. And this avert, I'm also I'm going to, I think I'm going to go ahead and copyright that term, averted 
and listening. Uh, because it's normally used, or I should say a lot of times it's used in, in the sort of concept, this, this type of five senses concept is a lot of times it's used with averted vision. Like for example, anybody that has a telescope is going to know immediately what I'm talking about. If you're, if you have your telescope set up and say you're looking at a far away heavenly body, like a planet like Saturn or Neptune or something like that. A lot of times you can see it better by not looking directly at it. It's called averted vision. Sometimes you play better to a click by having averted listening, not listening directly to it. You are listening around it and you are stating your time and your feel around the click. Learn it. Love it. That is, I, I don't know that I have ever heard anyone directly state that before. This is a concept that I have been building and kind of, for better term, kind of formulating this concept for the last 15 years. But that's the best way that I can put it. Don't let the click drag you around. Don't play target practice with it. And don't let the other musicians push or pull you, right? Be the time. Be the groove. State it confidently state it musically, right? And then pretty much the rest of it is going to take care of itself. It's going to feel good and sound good and be in time, okay? Part B of this, before we go ahead and move on to another part of, of playing with a click, is that it's very easy when you are listening almost too intently to the click itself. If you feel yourself straying from it, if you feel yourself getting a little ahead or a little behind, our brains are such magnificent, just wonders of the universe that we can literally correct, or, in, or my terminology is overcorrect, in between beats. And that's what creates these little time anomalies. I call them like little humps inside of our grooves and they're they're you know they're almost imperceptible when you're playing but when you go back and listen to it you realize that oh my gosh I overcorrected I was a little bit ahead and I fell back too much to get in time with the click too quickly and it just sounds weird same thing if you're falling back a little bit on the click all of a sudden you hit the gas pedal a little too hard and you've created again a little bit of an anomaly uh, to where you've kind of jerked back into tempo, back in time with that click right on top of it too much, and it just sounds weird. It sounds unnatural. And you would, let me go ahead and say this, you would never have that happen in a situation when you're playing without the click. It's just that we're trying to be too precise, trying to be right on top of it. So again, if you find yourself getting off the click a little bit, a little bit ahead, a little bit behind, don't panic. Don't overcorrect. Gradually steer the ship back on course. Let me tell you, if you just gradually manipulate the time over a period of a measure or so, up a little bit or back a little bit, depending on if you're dragging or rushing, that will be pretty much imperceptible. As a matter of fact, there was a study done years and years and years ago that the overall general listening public, now we're not talking about eagle-eared musicians like yourself and myself, could not tell a tempo change of more than 6 BPM on either side of a starting tempo over a 60-second period, okay? Let me, let me kind of re-explain that for a second. And basically what it would mean is this. If your starting tempo was at 120, okay, the general public could not tell if you had sped up to 126 or slower to 114, slowed down to 114, over a one-minute period of time. In other words, a gradual slowdown or a gradual speed up was basically imperceptible to the general public. Now, I 
I am relatively sure that that gradation or that gradient is smaller at slower tempos and larger at even faster tempos. Like, for example, if you started at 50, it's a little bit easier to tell if you're up or down 6 BPM over that period of time. But that was the tempo that I generally recall. So anyway, again, just to kind of reiterate and, and kind of embolden my point here, don't overcorrect, right? Keep it easy. Slowly steer the ship back on track, and it will be imperceptible, right? Now, the next thing, let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about playing with a click. Click manipulation, which we already kind of talked about that a tad bit. And by click manipulation, what I want to talk about is the concept of playing right on the beat, playing behind the beat, playing on top of the beat. And I think everybody is, is vaguely aware of what that means. And I'll explain it a little bit further as we go along and, and kind of how I approach it and how you can kind of practice it as well and how it's valid and how it's actually it's easier to do with a click than it is um, without one. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to go ahead and say that uh, – there's a, another common misconception, and I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a of a story to relate this to. Um, a lot of people think when you play with a click that you are playing right on top of that sucker all the time, that you're playing right on it. And if you're not right on it, then you're wrong. That's wrong. And the story I like to tell everybody it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's an insane story, but it's true. I heard the guy tell it. There's a pretty fantastic drummer who will go unnamed that relates a story about years ago when he was in the studio, back in the days of analog recording when we were actually using tape. For you folks who've never seen that before, go back to like 2001, A Space Odyssey, that movie by Kubrick and find those big old reel-to-reel looking jobs that you see on there that's spinning big old spools of tape. That's what we're talking about. And <clears throat> this drummer was talking about doing a session, and uh, they were using a click track. And when they finished a take, they walked back into the control room to give a listen, kind of see how it sounded. And... <clears throat> They were like, yeah, feeling good, everything's good, sounds all right. They finished listening to it, and the engineer, the eagle-eared engineer says, yeah, but drummer A, you were not on the click. And the drummer goes, well, what do you mean? And the engineer managed to actually take the tape and what he did was he slowed it down. It's called, uh, the, the terminology I'm going to use here is called rocking the hubs or rocking the wheels of tape, which is where you leave the, you leave the actual audio heads on to where you can actually hear, uh, you know, you can hear what the tape is playing, but, but the spools are not spinning. You're actually rocking the actual spools of tape, and it sounds real slow, you know, when you're going when you're rocking them. I think it, you also call it scrubbing as well when you do that. But anyway, what this engineer did was he had recorded the click track and he had muted all the channels except for, say, like the bass and bass drum and the snare drum. And what he was doing is he was rocking those, uh, those uh, spools of tape and he could hear like the bass drum and snare drum flamming with the click. Just going to let that sit there for a minute. Absurd. It's ridiculous. It, it, that's, I understand what this guy was trying to say, but no one that I'm aware of can sit down and play a four minute song and have every limb land directly on the click. It's absurd, and it would sound and feel like a metron or feel like a programmed drum machine. Stop it. Just get away from me with that. 
So anyway, that's the story I want to say. And now we're going to talk about this click manipulation. Because every good feeling track that I like, even if it's played with a click, there's some variation and there's some laying back or pushing ahead or whatnot. So just want to talk a little bit about my concept of how I approach it and how to actually make this happen when you're playing with a click. First and foremost, my mental concept is that my bass drum is going to try to play on the beat. And again, I'm not playing target practice with this, but I want to try to put it as squarely on the beat as possible. And then if I want to adjust my time feel as far as like playing ahead, behind, or right on the beat, I just try to make my snare drum land in the correct playing position, whether it be ahead or behind. So like for example, all right, if I want to play a groove that's a little more laid back and behind the beat, my mental process is to try and place the bass drum on the beat. Again, not playing target practice. But conceptually, my mind thought is put the bass drum on the beat. And then I will lay my hands back a tad bit. Make the snare drum a little behind the beat. That's what gives you that feel. If I want to play on top of the beat, I will try to make the hands get a little bit ahead of the click to create a little bit of excitement. Try to keep it as consistent as possible. The bass drum, again, I'm trying to, regardless of playing ahead or behind, I try to keep that bass drum conceptually on the beat, right on the click. All right? So that's it. And, and I'll tell you that here's another great thing for you to do. Here's a little bit of drumming anthropology for everybody here. And that's something that's, by the way, sorely missing in, in most of our practice is, is getting our heads out of books and getting our heads out of just individual, like these instructional lick-based videos and stuff. Let's do some conceptual practice. Let's do a little bit of drumming anthropology here. If you go and you dig around, you can find a whole host of these individual tracks. In other words, what they are is they're the raw stems from uh, different recording sessions. Um, and man, there's a whole pile of them out there uh, from different artists. And you can go and you can find those. And a lot of times you can find the click track they recorded with. And when you listen to the click track with the drum track, you will see some pushing and pulling, whether it be playing ahead or playing behind the beat. But if you take that click track out, feels like a million bucks. So if you are mindful and intentional with this and being musical with it, you are manipulating this click track to a point to where you are creating a human feel, a human groove that feels great, invites the rest of the band to play their best with you when you're doing that. So, again, go out and do a little anthropo anthropological dig. Find some of that stuff that I'm talking about, and you'll get a good idea of where I'm coming from with that. Now, one last big topic I want to cover, and you'll have to be a little bit careful with this because... This is the kind of thing that's sometimes not incredibly well received by other musicians. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. <clears throat> but here's how you can relate this concept to the rest of your band. In other words, in the studio with a full rhythm section and definitely playing live with a full band. And this is this is with a with a click. We're gonna we're gonna leave a sequence out of this for a second because a sequence can sometimes have a feel to it. Clicks don't have a feel. Clicks just they just beat out general generic time, okay, as a reference. So we're talking about a click here. When you're playing in a band, when you're playing in a rhythm section, 
all rhythm sections sound their best when they're playing together. In other words, when they are phrasing their time together. And in virtually all straight eighth note based situations where you're using a click, the drummer is the one that primarily states that time, states that straight eighth note time. We are the regulator of that. And the rest of the band, if they play to our time and impose their good time feel with us, with our drummer, with our with us, I should say, then most of the time you're going to have a good feeling, good sounding rhythm section because the drummer's being used as the governor, the time, right? In other words, we're playing to the drummer's time and the great rhythm sections that we all know and love, you can insert rhythm section A here, whichever one you like that you think of that grooves really hard. That's how they do it. That's how they do it. So, I'm going to tell you how they don't do it. Or I should tell you how not to do it. When you're playing with a click with a live band, whether it's in the studio or on the stage, the drummer should have the loudest click. And that click is the drummer's reference. Everyone else in the band, whether it be vocalist, guitar, bass, keys, horns, whatever, have the click set low enough to where you can hear the drummer as the primary timekeeper. You relate to these other musicians to listen to you first, not the click. The click should only be loud enough in their monitors to where when the drums drop out, if they have a broken down part of the, of the song, to where then they can hear the click to keep time. They should be playing to your time as a drummer, not the click. Because too many times, it's, it's too often, that everyone has the click too loud in their ears and everyone relates to that click differently as far as like where they play their time. And if the drummer is playing a different time to the metronome that the bass player is, and the keyboard's playing a different time to the click than the drummer and the bass player is, and then the guitar player or players are playing to a different time with the click than the drummer and the keyboard and the bassist, and then... The percussionist is doing that. And the singers, you see what you've got, a big mish mash of mush. So, very, very delicately, tell your future, or your future, tell your current bandmates to humor you, if, the, if nothing else, if they don't believe in you. Turn that click down in their ears to where, you, where they are listening to the drums state the time. And again, only have it loud enough in their ears to where they can hear it if there's a broken down part that they're exposed and they have to play with and there's no drums or no other rhythm section going with it. It will help the, it'll help the overall time feel and the groove and sound of the band virtually instantly because again think about it if you pull that click out and you are not using it they would be listening to the drummer to state the time in the groove so there you go well that's about all i got not that you necessarily need any more than that right but i had a lot of again a lot of comments a lot of folks interested in this topic and it's something that I feel very passionately about and it's something that I feel like everyone needs to be familiar with everybody needs to be super comfortable with because you don't want to be that guy that you that you that I guarantee you've heard before oh we don't need to be playing with a click Rare Earth didn't play with a click. Grand Funk didn't play with a click. And The Who certainly didn't play with a click. You know what that was the sound of? 
That was the sound of dinosaurs stuck in the tar pits. Don't be that. Embrace the, the reality of playing with clicks and sequences. And uh, again, like Ndugu Chancellor said, follow that click to freedom, folks. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks again for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. As usual, we really, really respect and value your opinions and thoughts. Feel free to go to our uh, Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast and our Twitter page at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast. Give us a message. Send us an email. Tell us a thought. Tell all your friends, especially if you like it. And even if you don't like it, tell all your friends. All right, that's it for now. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Shoot me, baby. Shoot me.